Okay, so uh, welcome again to the School of Architecture at the University of Queensland's public lecture series, North by Northwest, Local and Global Architectural Culture. Uh, we have a double bill tonight, uh, bringing the local and global uh, into, into close proximity. Um, we're hoping to start a conversation after the, the lectures and we'll invite questions at the conclusion. Our speaker tonight is uh, our first speaker tonight is Geoffrey London, who is the Victorian Government Architect. He is also the Professor of Architecture at the University of Western Australia and has held the position of Professorial Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Geoffrey was for a period of nearly five years the inaugural Government Architect in Western Australia. He is a past Dean and Head of School at UWA, past Chair of the Committee of Heads of Architecture Schools of Australasia a past president of the Western Australian chapter of the Australian Institute of Architects and a life fellow of the Institute. He is currently a member of the Australian Research Council's College of Experts and has acted as a consultant on numerous architectural and urban design projects. He has served on and acted as chair of many architectural design award juries and a large number of competition juries. He has retitled his lecture tonight Architecture Through a Government Architect's Lens. Please join with me in welcoming Geoffrey. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure for me to come to Brisbane. I'm going to talk about um, some conditions surrounding the making of architecture, as the title suggests, through the lens of a government architect uh, through that five years of experience in Western Australia first and now nearly three years in Victoria. In those roles you're exposed to a reasonably narrow field of government and institutional work with views asked on the occasional private sector project. And because of that kind of exposure I've developed certain preoccupations and you'll hear me talk about those. I think that a key mission in the role uh, and I'm sure it's the same around Australia with all the government architects, is to help establish the conditions within which design quality may be enabled. Now, the role in Victoria involves two key areas. One is advocacy, and I'm not going to read those, and I don't expect you to, but these are out of the duty statement, and uh, an advisory role. Um, much of the work that we do uh, is reactive to projects that come across our desks, but we also initiate our own projects, and they're listed there. Uh, in Victoria, the role is located in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, but interestingly, as an initiative of the government that's recently been elected there with a Premier who is an architect, uh, we're embarking on a more independent trajectory. Uh, Differently from Western Australia, all of the key government departments deliver their own projects, which makes coordination of delivery very difficult. Um, there is also an outfit called the Major, Major Projects Victoria, MPV, which does deliver the biggest projects. Um, there's very little consistency across the board. The, the previous role in Western Australia was out of a delivery agency, a single delivery agency, the Department of Housing and Works. And as a result, it was possible to affect the processes for procuring projects. When I took on the role in Western Australia, the only other state that had an equivalent kind of government architect was here in Queensland, and Michael Kenniger held the role. New South Wales had a government architect in place, but it was, and I think still is, a difficult kind of role because uh, in addition to advising the government, they also have to compete with the private sector for government work. So I think it's compromised in a number of ways. We now have a government architect in every state in Australia, and in my view, that's a very good thing. Now, in those early days, I sought guidance from wherever I could, and Michael Kenniger was very helpful in that regard. But the most thorough, uh, well-researched and valued guidance came from the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, CABE, and I think what an extraordinary model it has been. Um, a lot of their work was focused on 
design review. Um, we've had some images drop out, I'm afraid, in the transfer from a Mac to a PC, but it doesn't really matter. That's design review in process where CABE, in its previous uh, manifestation, had several rooms dedicated to the process of design review. And once a month, they would have these wonderful Fridays where you would go through six projects in some detail where the best architects in the land would come and present their work and receive a peer review. Um, some projects came back time and time again because in the view of the CABE design review panel, they weren't up to scratch for whatever reason. Um, we're now establishing a similar panel in Victoria and South Australia is doing the same. CABE interestingly makes all of its design reviews public. They're placed on the web uh, so everyone can see the range of thoughts that evolved in examining the work. Um, there's some detail that shows you their views on a particular project. CABE produces an incredibly broad range of publications. Um, they've attempted in this document to quantify the benefits of good design and that's an extraordinarily useful thing to attempt to do. It's a long-term project that CABE took on with the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. They talk about things like uh, the value of design in various types of building and the healthcare example is one that's become very broadly accepted with a range of different uh, agencies promoting exactly the same arguments and being able through evidence-based work to demonstrate clearly the benefits of good design. Now after years of arguing the benefits of good design, they ended up producing a document that talks about the cost of bad design and they felt that this document was probably more direct in its impact. Um, they argue that bad design costs where good design adds value and this whole document is directed towards making that argument as coherent as they can. CABE developed seven principles of good design and these look uh, pretty straightforward when you look through them but these have been honed over many years and I find them an incredibly useful set of principles to refer to. CABE's documents are always directed towards a level of accessibility that we as architects don't often achieve. Under a uh, government austerity campaign in the UK, CABE's future is now uncertain and they're forced into a fairly unholy marriage with the Design Council. Now, from my time uh, in the government architect roles, the issues that have emerged as important for me are these. And I'll go through them one by one. The first one is the procurement of architectural services. It's often the case that architectural work is procured by asking architects to bid for it on the basis of fees. And the first argument I put when I came into the role in Western Australia was that is not how you procure good architecture. And at that stage, the government was very receptive to these arguments. And we argued that design quality had to be a major criteria of selection. Um, we affected the wording of the expressions of interest that went out to make sure that the demand for design quality was right up front as a key criteria. And then we did the same with the request for proposal, the RFP, ensuring that design quality was a major criteria for selection. So I thought I'd run through a few projects that have just recently been completed in Perth that came through this process, where we put out an RFP that would, to the selected, say, three or four from the EOI shortlisting process, they would be asked to produce a design approach. They'd be paid for it. They'd be given a two-week period. We wanted to assess how they would approach that project if they were given the job through a series of diagrams, through using precedents of their own work and through precedents of others. Um, it gave the client group much more confidence in selecting their architect because they were able to make a judgment about how well they could work with them and whether the values that the architects were putting in front of them in any way aligned with their own. So this is a recently completed TAFE college, the central TAFE, uh, in the centre of, well, just on the edge of Perth, in Northbridge, and it's done by uh, Lions Architects and TNZ in association. <coughs> and the same uh, interior view of the major entry as you enter the building. And the same approach was used to 
procure the architects for the Perth Arena, and this is a 14,000 indoor stadium with a roof that is able to slide open, uh, designed by Ashton Ragger McDougall in association with CCN and RTKL. We also did things like encourage the partnering of larger firms with emerging architects. It's a potentially very fraught process because there can be unfortunate outcomes in the way one firm works with another in forced marriages. Um, nevertheless, we thought it was worth the trial. Sadly, this project was never built, but it's uh, a sustainable social housing project in the, in the centre of Perth. And it was Jones Calder Young with the smaller uh, practice, uh, Iredale, Peterson and Hook. Another thing we did was to de-emphasise the role of fees in the selection process. And we initially nominated fees so that architects, when they bid for projects, knew what fees they were getting. And they were always intended to be a fair fee, not a generous fee, not a mean fee, but a, but a fair fee. And we discussed the nomination of fee points with the Institute of Architects. <clears throat> then we also introduced a process where we used a second envelope where the fees the fee bid was only opened after the design-based selection process had been undertaken. And you then negotiated the fee with the architect. If it fell within a pre-nominated band, you would simply accept it and go ahead. Um, I came under a fair bit of flack in Western Australia over doing such things by practices who argued that they should be allowed to buy work when they needed to. Um, it's an interesting argument that goes on. Uh, another process we, we tested was using a government-initiated uh, uh, master planning exercise, which resulted in this, as the basis for critique through a workshopping exercise, where we had shortlisted a group of architects. They came on board with a number of others uh, and workshopped to establish a set of design principles for the Perth waterfront. And out of that process, we then selected uh, the architects to carry the project forward. Uh, and that is what is shortly to be built in Perth on the foreshore. For those of you who know Perth, that is the Barrack Street jetty just here. So the whole of the previous grassed esplanade is gone and the city will be brought very emphatically up to the river. We ran competitions as another means of procuring work um, and, and we ran several open and invited Again, competitions, I think, are often fraught. You always end up with someone bemoaning the outcome and sour grapes because all of us architects believe that we have the best solution. Um, the new state theatre was recently completed and it was won through international competition by Kerry Hill Architects, who has an office in Western Australia and Singapore. Um, just to give you a fuller idea of it. For Perth, it's the first new uh, cultural building that the state has completed for a considerable number of years. So our view was it had to be pretty, pretty damn good. Uh, what was delivered through the competition process through this particular design was that uh, whilst the brief had called for two performance spaces, by stacking the main performance spaces on top of one another, Kerry Hill's firm was able to deliver four performance spaces. And I think that's a very good outcome. <clears throat> that's the interior of the main theatre. Uh, another competition that we ran was a national housing competition, um, foundation housing, won by a small Western Australian firm called CODA, and that project is very near completion now. So that brief discussion talks about procuring architects. The next thing I wanted to talk about was procurement of projects. Um, there's a range of procurement projects, you know, procurement strategies used by governments. Some are more friendly to realising architectural quality than others. Uh, and each, I think, needs strategies to ensure that quality is protected. The first that many of you will have heard of is the PPP, the Public-Private Partnership, favoured by many Australian governments. Uh, it's an exercise where risk is divested uh, from the public purse to the private and the government believes that they're encouraging a high degree of competition in the process. My first PPP experience in Western Australia was problematic. 
um, because it had been rushed to a financial close before we could really negotiate better outcomes, better design outcomes. So everything after that was a trade-off. In Victoria, PPPs are uh, strongly subscribed to, but they're handled there well. Uh, there's a very strong emphasis on design quality from the outset. Um, I'm going through a process at the moment on a major new healthcare project where we used interactive workshops with the three bidders where design quality was a key factor in all of those workshops. It's understood there now in Victoria that if you don't come in with a good design team, you're not going to win the project. And that's emphasised through all of the promotional literature associated with the work, the EOIs, the RFPs, etc. So this is the Royal Children's Hospital by Bates Smart, Billard Lease and uh, HKS. And the desalination plant by ARM and Peck von Hartl. Now in those two instances, design was very strongly foregrounded in the process. In the UK, they developed a process which I think would work very well here in Australia, which they call the Smart PFI. Uh, PFI is the equivalent there of the PPP, where they select the design first and then put it out to the private sector. Um, there's a huge amount of money expended by bidders in the PPP process. It's terribly wasteful. Um, the emotional energy invested is also vast. Uh, by seeking the design first, uh, you'd save a portion of that, but you'd also get a design in the first instance that was far better fitted to client agency requirements. Now, another thing we got involved with was where government was selling land for developments, where we tied design quality to the sale of the land, and government was actually prepared to take a hit on the cost of the land to ensure a better designed outcome. This is another recently completed project in Perth, 140 William Street, built over the top of a new underground railway station. Land owned by government, uh, sold off with that requirement that a good design project be produced, and in this instance of a high sustainability rating. Uh, this project was designed by Perth's Hassel office. The approach also changed government understanding of what value for money means. Uh, value for money too often is characterised by how cheap something is, whereas in fact if you, if you take a longer term view of it you can make the argument that good design saves considerable money. Another project was a strip of land at Leighton Beach, north of Fremantle in Western Australia, uh, sold off by Landcorp, the government's development agency. Again, uh, Landcorp took a hit on this. There were higher bidders in terms of dollar value offered, but the design quality won it for Mervac using uh, Kerry Hill Architects and Michael Petroni. So this was part of their bid, and this is how it now looks with the first stage of it completed. Um, we used design review panels in both these instances, the Leighton and the 140 William Street, to help shepherd the project and protect the design quality through the process of uh, value management. Design construct is the really difficult one, particularly when novation occurs too early in the process. Uh, the, the only strategy that we've attempted there is to use design intent documents that are locked into the contract when it's signed so we have a point of reference uh, whenever something starts going astray. But the danger so often is that architects are novated too early uh, and uh, quality is lost in the process. In Melbourne at the moment, I'm involved with the refurbishment of Hamer Hall. When I say involved, I, I cannot claim any merit, any credit for any of this architectural work. It's all done by very good architects. I'm there as the broker, uh, the, the person who attempts to streamline connections between different agencies. Um, this is Hamer Hall, uh, a project that was um, awarded again on the basis of EOI and RFP with the design approach and ARM won this one with Peter Elliott uh, and it's now halfway through delivery but it's being delivered through an alliance contract. Um, alliances are often used for major pieces of infrastructure not too often with major civic works like this and to the best of my knowledge this is only the second time in Australia that an alliance has been used for a major civic project the first being the National Museum. 
It was the view of Major Projects Victoria, who were responsible for project managing this project, that um, this was the only way this project could be delivered within the budget and on time. Um, alliancing is a process where, as the name suggests, the architect, the contractor and the client work closely together in a no-blame uh, alliancing exercise. Now, another area that um, I think has been critical has been in the area of policy and regulation. Uh, we are in the process of preparing a policy on architecture. Um, there are policies in many parts of the world and it's no surprise that where those policies exist, you do get very high quality architecture being produced. And what it does is it commits, our, it commits governments to ensuring that processes are in place that do enable good quality architecture to be fostered. Um, the only real policy of which I'm aware in Australia at the moment is the SEP 65 that operates out of Sydney, which is for apartment design, where it is mandated that architects be used for apartments over a certain number, I think it's four, and over a certain number of storeys, which I think from memory is two. Uh, and there are a set of performance standards that need to be met. And what it's done is it's raised the bar of the design quality of apartments there considerably. That is the actual piece of legislation. And a design code was produced to help support it. And they also have in place uh, a process within the SEP for design review panels, which again try and shepherd the project through the process. Design advocacy we pursue through a variety of means. Uh, one, we publish. We produce a range of good design publications that fold out into large posters and you often see them around local authorities. Uh, we're producing um, a book on contemporary Victorian architecture. Um, I have to admit that we use the model of heat as our starting point for the argument. I thought that was a terrific uh, thing to come out of Queensland. Advocacy is fugitive, I think, because people change roles very quickly. Um, it's hard won, the argument about the need to pursue design quality, uh, and then very easily lost. Emerging architects, we've spoken already about this particular strategy, which we used across several projects, but we also put in place um, a process where we could appoint directly uh, emerging architects to give them access to government work uh, as a starting point for them and to, to allow them to feel that their role in the whole process was valued. Uh, we also established an Emerging Architects Award. I wanted to talk also about demonstration projects. Um, there's nothing quite like having the built example in place, something that you can walk around and point to and say, this is what it's like, the sky won't fall in, if you double your density or some such thing. Uh, I believe it's particularly the case in housing uh, and thinking about how values may be shifted towards that greater degree of acceptance of medium density housing. So we were involved with a project that Vic Urban, which is the government's development arm, uh, produced recently called Habitat 21, where architects were in a competitive situation asked to design uh, five houses that did these things to the density. So there's a significant increase in density on smaller lots, smaller houses with a much higher sustainability outcome. Uh, and there was also the requirement that the houses have built into them a high degree of flexibility and adaptability. And this, this house proved to be the most popular of those in the little display village that Vic Irvin built for very good reasons. Um, it is highly flexible in the way it can be used uh, and it's shown here in this series of slides demonstrating the range of options that the house presents. This was designed um, by Shane Murray uh, and Graham Christ when they were both at RMIT, although Shane has now shifted to, um, to Monash. And their concern was to produce a house that really had very few architectural frills but simply used basic um, sound architectural thinking to produce a much higher degree of amenity than is usually the case in project houses. Um, we have 
retained our involvement with Shane Murray and his team at Monash University in producing what we hope will be a demonstration project again. Um, we're going through the process now of ensuring that it will be built, and it is, as you can see, designing affordable, sustainable housing dash. It's on 10 blocks in Ringwood, um, where we're producing 79, uh, 79 housing units. We asked Monash to go through a whole range of investigations that you could not expect uh, an architectural practice to take on in the normal course of events. Um, before they came up with some propositions that we will then put out to the private sector to deliver. So what we were able to establish with Monash was a set of standards which form our base. Uh, and they explored a whole range of constructional opportunities, a whole range of uh, arrangement possibilities on the site, uh, and a whole range of sustainability uh, outcomes through various means. It's all been costed along the way by a committed quantity surveyor and we've ended up with a mix of apartments and townhouses on the site, as I say, delivering uh, 79 units where there were once 10. So it's a serious increase in density. Uh, the government is now pursuing the means by which it can be built. Uh, we have problems with our valuer general who uh, the process is once you plan to do a project like this, the value of the land increases dramatically uh, and we have difficulty as a result uh, demonstrating the, um, the outcome as being value for money for the government. Nevertheless, we press on. Uh, again, uh, Monash produced a range of possible uses within the apartments that allow a degree of adaptability that you simply don't get in Melbourne apartments at the moment. Same with the townhouses. Precedents. I think a city feeds off its architectural successes uh, and these precedents foster a more expectant public with an increased appreciation of what architecture can offer. So I thought I'd finish by running through a few precedents in Melbourne that have been extremely useful in, in that regard. Firstly, I just want to point out a, a competition that was held back in 1979 in Melbourne, uh, and it was to design an icon for the city, an architectural icon. This was from back in the days when Melbourne felt it needed to have something that could compete with the Sydney Opera House. What Melbourne didn't realise then, but I do think it realises it now, is that the icon is the city itself. Um, the city and the way it's developed over the last 15 to 20 years has become a very special urban place. Back in the late 90s, the Kennett government instituted an international competition to deliver the Melbourne Museum, which we can see here in the foreground, um, relating to the grand old uh, exhibition building um, from much earlier days. And the process of delivering through a competition uh, establishes extraordinary expectations, uh, which was probably realised most fully with Fed Square. Um, this was a process where people would speak on television on a daily basis about how much they loved or hated what they saw rising in front of them. But it certainly had the city talking about architecture and it's now a very much used facility. And the vaults underneath that were once a fairly dangerous, disused part of an old piece of infrastructure have now been converted as a result of the success of Fed Square into a, a terrific place to go and have a drink after work and uh, share a sausage with a friend. They do specialise in grilled sausages. Um, that was completed by six degrees. The Shrine of Remembrance which dated from 1933 originally. 70 years later, there were additions by ARM. And in a sense, it's the antithesis of what came first, which was the Greek revival uh, monument um, atop the hill. Here we have depressions into the earth uh, and we don't have the regularity of classical antiquity. Instead, we have these relatively random shapes that could be seen as bomb blasts. Uh, but can also be seen as 
the faces of trenches from warfare. Um, it's a very powerful new addition. And then you have investment in things like major infrastructure, where along, alongside the major roads coming into Melbourne, you see these quite astonishing bits of public art and gateways that welcome you in. So this framed view of the city of Melbourne from the Craigieburn Bypass Bridge by Tonkin's Leica Greer and continuing on this wonderful work by Taylor Cullity Lethlian and Robert Owen, the, um, the artist, um, work that responds to the frequency of traffic so the LEDs uh, vibrate according to the number of cars that are travelling past it. Uh, that recent history of engaging architects to integrate sculptural elements into major roads continues with uh, sound walls here from um, Wood Marsh. Uh, this green object is an operations centre uh, integrated into the sound wall. And little rest areas like this Calder Woodburn rest area by BKK uh, two hours drive of Melbourne, a modest public facility that provides an opportunity for a good young design practice. And the Webb Bridge, using the remnants of a rail bridge over the Yarra where public infrastructure becomes public art, done by DCM and Robert Owen. And the forms here are derived from eel traps of the original inhabitants of the area. The Southern Cross Station by Grimshaw Jackson, the joint venture, with its undulating roof of dune-like forms, and more recently, the North Melbourne Station. Uh, and I show these because it demonstrates the level of commitment that the Department of Transport has to good design. They've actually appointed someone to work in my office to ensure delivery processes that are able to realise good quality architecture. This is the North Melbourne Station by the Cox Group. And then you see projects like this. The Queen Victoria Complex. It's a development of a whole city block done by a single developer. Now, the tendency in this kind of development is often to do a, a mega structure base, a plinth with a whole series of towers on the top. In this instance, Grocon pursued a fairly enlightened approach where they decided that they would give a number of buildings to different architects. So, in a sense, it's repeating the process that you find in the normal accretion of a city where different architects build cheek by jowl. So you find that NH very skillfully did all the base work, the subterranean work, the shopping arcades, and repeated through the site a series of laneways that are much like the very successful laneways of Melbourne. And the buildings were done by a kind of who's who at that time of uh, Melbourne architects. So there was Denton Corker Marshall, John Wardle, McBride, Charles Ryan, Kirsten Thompson, Lyons uh, and NH themselves. Then there's the Melbourne Theatre and Recital Centre, again by ARM, where the concept of the box as container is taken to new levels and the wrapping containing, contains the precious interior of the recital hall with timber grain writ very large. Then there's Council House 2, the City of Melbourne nailing its colours to the mast, designing in collaboration with Design Inc, Australia's first six-star Green Star office building for its own occupation, and the sustainable systems of the building become the architectural features of it. And you find little gems like this tucked away in side lanes, Monaco House by McBride Charles Ryan, with one of the better little coffee houses in its ground floor, facing the impenetrable wall of the Melbourne Club. The Seaford Life Saving Club by Robert Simeone. Um, and this is a result of an, an enlightened local council running a competition for, again, younger architects. Uh, and this is an all-timber complex on the coast uh, containing a range of functions with the timber walling tuned to reflect that range. And then you find the Yardmaster building uh, down in Docklands, again by McBride Charles Ryan, 
a mysterious black object in a sea of rail tracks, uh, an architectural opportunity realised from the most prosaic of workaday buildings. And then you see amazing things like this house museum uh, done by Lyons for one of their directors, Corbett Lyon. Uh, it's an example of patronage um, that exists within the architectural profession in Melbourne. And this is a very odd hybrid building. It's a museum that they actually live in. So it's an inhabited museum, uh, and the bedrooms come off these gallery spaces. Sometimes the bedroom doors are left open when the public moves through. Sometimes they're not. Uh, and when it's not used as a museum, it's the most extraordinary house, with people surrounded by this astonishing collection of Australian art. And the Fitzroy School uh, by McBride Charles Ryan delivered during the period of the education revolution. It's an addition to an old school which was designed in very close collaboration with the school, exploring how learning spaces might work outside the traditional classroom. And as you, as you can see, it makes use of a curvilinear plan adorned with a patchwork of coloured glazed brick. So Melbourne, I'd, I'd characterise as being a place of ideas-based architecture with the profession being strong, uh, articulate and often quite tribal. But there are smaller things that have helped Melbourne become a vital urban place, uh, a place that I think bristles with civic pride. Over an extended period of time, the uniform application of bluestone paving to the footpaths of the city has given a consistent and high quality base to, the, to these public areas. It's a signal, I think, that this is a domain that values and honours the presence of the public. And the Melbourne bar culture is rich and urbane, really the result of fortuitous economic conditions and a very savvy change to the liquor licensing laws. Uh, Melbourne was the last, or Victoria was the last state in Australia as far as I understand it, to drop the licensing laws that ended up in the six o'clock swill outcome where all the bars had to close at six. So the, the lanes of the city now teem with bars, rooftops, cellars, old sweatshops, holes in the wall. They've all been drawn into use as quirky bars. And they open up a whole new experience of the city. The Victorian community has shown that it's prepared to embrace architectural ideas and to acknowledge their contribution to the broader culture of the state. It appears to be understood that this is how identity and myths are established. And perhaps in Victoria this has always been the case. And I believe this base of achievement to be important as a means of cultivating the expectation of architectural quality. And I see that in this precinct here in Brisbane, I think this is becoming another exemplar of that kind of ambition. Thank you. Thanks, Geoffrey. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to introduce our second speaker tonight on his first visit to Australia. Uh, Mark Lee. Welcome to Australia and Brisbane, Mark. Uh, Mark practices out of Los Angeles and for the last two years has taught uh, at TU Berlin and is currently working with uh, master's students uh, in Auckland. Since his, its founding in 1998 by Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee in Los Angeles, Johnston and Mark Lee's work has included residential, retail, commercial, hospitality and institutional projects, and varied in scale from master plans to contemporary buildings and temporary installations. Having produced notable designs for art galleries and temporary exhibitions and frequently working as curators, their work has shown a particular focus on the arts and often involves collaborations beyond those typical to architecture, involving contemporary artists, graphic designers, writers and photographers. Mark has entitled his lecture, Too Young to Reason, Too Grown Up to Dream. Mark. Thank you, Andrew, for the uh, 
uh, introduction and the uh, uh, invitation to come and share our modest work and, and some of the thoughts that have guided our work. Indeed, it's my uh, first day in uh, Brisbane, first time in Australia, so to be received by such beautiful weather and uh, then uh, a lecture on the, the role of the government architect, I think, uh, what else could one ask for? <laughs> and I'm going to Melbourne tomorrow, so I'm very excited with the, with the presidents and glad to know that the bars don't close at 6 o'clock anymore. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, as Andrea mentioned, I, uh, we have worked very closely with the uh, fine arts community since we first started our practice 13 years ago. Uh, we've worked with institutions, uh, collectors, collaborated with artists. So if, if architecture is, uh, is our wife, uh, I think contemporary art is a very good mistress to us. So I always like to uh, show our work in relationship to some contemporary art in a way that it helps us think about our work, also think about our direction. Um, also, showing one's work collectively is quite an uh, opportunity because sometimes we work very particularly on one project. So to see the project as a group, you know, sometimes we ask certain questions of what holds the projects together. This is a, an image of a piece by uh, Damien Hirst. Uh, the title of this piece is uh, Isolated Elements Swimming in the Same Direction for the Purpose of Understanding. And, and I find this quite interesting. It's all, they're all dead fish. They're, it's all fish but different species you know, moving towards one direction. And this perhaps uh, reflects more of a, a traditional avant-garde model. You know, you all forge towards one direction. If you swim far enough, you'll get there. Uh, another model that I like better is represented by this piece here by the Los Angeles-based artist, Kim Dingle. Uh, the title of this piece is uh, uh, United Shapes of America. And uh, it, it is a, a composite drawing of US maps drawn from memory by teenagers from Las Vegas. And, <laughs> I think, uh, I think you can see most of these teenagers uh, maybe should not apply to architecture program, uh, except for maybe this one here, that uh, truly has a global understanding. Maybe uh, University of Queensland could give them a scholarship. But um, what, what interests me about this piece is also, you know, the, of course, all the differences, all the different interpretations of the map. And, and we often ask, what, what holds it together? It's really the, the shared mnemonic shape of the US map, that because we all know the shape, then all these differences can occur. So uh, it, it prompts me to ask, like, do we, do we have a shared project in architecture? You know, we, today, every, anything goes. You know, with di digital technology, there's so many different directions. Do we still have a shared project? You know, if, if, the, if we do, uh, what is the equivalent of this shape uh, of this map? You know, I think historically, you know, Duran might talk about typology, Rossi might talk about memory. I think there are all these different attempts to find a common ground between architects. Um, well, I lost the image here, but certainly I think w when one shows your own projects, you also ask yourself, uh, be self-reflective, what, what holds your, your work together? Um, the answer is nothing. <laughs> oh, I think I have a problem here. Could someone help me? I think it's not uh, advancing. Or maybe all the images are gone. <laughs> or oh, it crashed. I'll, I'll make it up by showing the images very quickly. Uh, that's not, I think it's, 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 it's a forward advanced and maybe it's crashed. Oh, that's strange. Uh, I've nothing to say when there are no images. <laughs> no. Uh, well, the, the title of my, my lecture um, uh, is uh, from a Brian Ferry song, Slave to Love. And um, the other option for the title would be uh, Too Fast to Live and Too Young to Die from Malcolm McLaren or uh, Waylon Jennings, uh, Too Dumb for New York and Too Ugly for L.A. You know, the, 
I, I love like songs from from uh, titles from songs because uh, this it always describes like position of an architect. You know, it's caught between two extreme situations. So where was I? Oh, reflecting on one's work. Uh, um, uh, Francois Truffaut said that uh, you can tell the entire career of a director by looking at the first 150 frames of his first film. And, and after reading that, I couldn't help but go back to the very first project we ever did, a project that never realized, but we worked on it for about a week. But when I look back, I think a lot of the DNA of our projects, the subsequent projects, were already contained in this little pavilion uh, designed in Michigan, where on one side it faces a very horizontal view of a river, the other side it faces a very vertical view of a, a valley. And we basically took one picture window, uh, positioned it horizontally facing the river, turned it 90 degrees to face vertically on the, on the uh, valley, connected it, and have a very similar uh, uh, plan as well as a section. We basically took one curvature, uh, flip it alternately in terms of conve convex and concave, and then basically come up with the, the, the house itself became a, a window. Um, so in, in a way, we never really work with complex surfaces that we would start off with an algorithm and then come up and, and, and came with an edge. We always start off with a definition of an edge and then develop the surface afterwards. Uh, this is a project in uh, Pacific Palisades that we finished about seven years ago. It's located very closely to, close to the uh, Charles and Ray Eames house. And it has a, quite a nice panoramic view, but a very difficult uh, lot, very uneven slope. And uh, uh, in the early 90s, uh, the city of Los Angeles implemented a hillside ordinance to discourage building on hillsides uh, in reaction to overbuilding in areas such as Hollywood Hills. So for hillsides that are uh, higher than a certain degree of slope, they have uh, string more stringent re re uh, restrictions in terms of setback and, and, and height limits. So when we start, out, start the project, we always look at like different precedents of building on the hillside as a sample. And, and basically, the first three samples are not feasible anymore for our lot. So the only sample, the only uh, model we could use is this terracing model. Um, but in, instead of just accepting it, we, we decided to go back and look at the restrictions that were given to us by the city, such as these drawings, in terms of maximum height from any given point or from the lowest to the highest point. And, and, and thought maybe instead of using it, using the restrictions as a policing device, perhaps we could find an oppor design opportunity from them. So not unlike what Hugh Ferris did in the 1920s when he began to take the setback of the skyscrapers and begin to imagine a crystalline city for New York. So step by step, we begin to uh, three-dimensionalize and model all of the restrictions and, and, and cook them together and form the, the largest uh, buildable volume allowable without uh, any variance and at the same time work with a structural engineer to develop um, the smallest footprint. Because those of you that know building on the hillside, a lot of money is spent in the underground uh, for the pylons, which easily could run as deep as the house. So at the end, we come up with a volume that is, has the smallest footprint and then the largest buildable envelope. And, and we wanted to bring that tension between small and large also in the way of, we designed the apertures. So we have uh, exaggerated windows that faces the view, and then we have much smaller windows that are set back uh, uh, also for, to protect, protect it from the sun uh, as well as the views from the neighbor. And so there are two types of views from the house, one very panoramic, one very sp uh, specific. We, we cladded the entire house with a, a, a grail coat, which is an industrial waterproofing material that's used for roofing to shrink wrap the entire house because it's slightly elastic. It didn't need any expansion joints like stucco. And because we built out to the uh, maximum buildable envelope, we couldn't have any uh, uh, balconies. But we still have this indoor-outdoor effect by completely sliding all the windows open. So suddenly, the house turns into a gazebo. And it became a very uh, site-specific volume that fits into the, the hillside. Um, the, 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 the house itself, uh, the lower floors are all constructed out of concrete, and the upper floors are constructed out of steel. Um, 
but uh, since the 1997 uh, building code, because in reaction to the, the seismic factor, uh, the structure has to be oversized and a lot of uh, diagonal bracings. And because this house is about 100 meters away from the Eames house, we decided not to expose the steel because it would look like a hill, hill, uh, steel house on steroids for people who have just visited the Eames house. So the only thing that you, 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 you can see that tell that it's a steel house is because of the lack of uh, uh, intermediary support inside the house as well as the large cantilevers. We were so excited about this uh, method of, uh, that we decided to do it for the entire hill. And, and we, we showed it to the planning department, but they were not as amused of the, the, as we were. <laughs> um, Uh, we, we still use a very uh, antiquated uh, design methods like collage. And uh, uh, not only for us, a very quick and visceral way to distill the essence of the house down to a, a corner window, but uh, this image has been so famous as an icon, as a representation of post-war living in Southern California. Sometimes we, we ask, like, how much did the architecture contribute to it? You know, can we take away the canopy of Pia Koenig's roof? Can we take away the foreground of the jacuzzi? And then boil down the whole image into a corner window and a distant view. And, and uh, b before the house was built, this image was published, and a lawyer friend said, well, you better talk to Julius Schulman, who was 95 at that time and still alive. Uh, otherwise, he could sue you for uh, copyright infringement. So we showed him this, this project, and he said, well, I, I will not sue you if, uh, if I could photograph it. So who, who are we to blow against the wind? So he came uh, and photographed the house, did about 12 photographs, and and 95 years old at that time, and worked with Neutra and Schindler and Frank Lloyd Wright. So the whole experience of seeing him photograph and capturing the space was an uh, incredible educational experience for us. He bought a lot of artificial lighting, a lot of underlit spaces. He brought his own furniture. He brought his own Jakobsen chair. And just see how he positioned that curve to receive the edge of the stair was great. And, and working with, uh, seeing Schumann's photographs got us interested in how projects are represented. Uh, later on, this Swiss artist, Marian Mueller, came and photographed the house and used, them, uh, used the image as diptychs and triptychs and began to combine the, the profiles together. Or um, seeing how the, houses are, how the house is, is published. Uh, this one is a, um, a catalog for a show at the Frankfurt Museum in, uh, in Germany when the curators called us and said, oh, your house is on the cover, we were delighted. Uh, but when we received the book, uh, not only was the house abstracted, it became the, 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 the base of the Statue of Liberty. Um, <laughs> or, or here, oh. Oh. Let's, let's see. They're very low res images. <laughs> Maybe Jess can stay with me here. <laughs> so sorry. Oh, no, no, no.
it's turning on now. I am so sorry no, no about this. No this has never happened before with the computer no in no particular. <laughs> we may just need to have to let it reload. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was the power? Seems to be plugged in. Yeah, I know. Okay. Let's hope we're only off one for a couple of seconds. And now your speech has been interrupted no, twice. No, 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 no. someone else to get another laptop so mm -hmm. if something happens again case, okay. we'll we'll swap it okay. over. It's nice to have some music in the background playing. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> Remember which slide you were up I to? I will, yeah. My friend is meant to be using this computer tomorrow, so I think I'll tell her not to. <laughs> Which slide was it? Oh, um, I mean, I can just forward it. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Hang on. Oh. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I start from the top? No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I'll go even faster now. Oh, uh, I, I just have to say I was, uh, we were really amused when we received this uh, CD from the manufacturer of the cladding material as a, a promotional a CD. Uh, when we received this, we, we decided that next time we'll do the window just, just like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is a, a project that we have worked on the, the last uh, two years. It's a small winery in the hills of... Uh, Tuscany in the town of Montepulciano that uh, has a really panoramic view of a Tuscan landscape. There are some existing buildings sitting on the top of the hill and uh, because the winery is quite large so we decided to bury most of the winery. So when you enter we decided to put a retaining wall and then put the winery down. So when you enter from the top the, the winery doesn't really block the view. So, But you enter from the top into an enclosed courtyard. So when you enter you basically, or before you enter, you begin to see the profile of the building. So not unlike these uh, medieval fortresses, and we begin to imagine uh, how to proliferate and grow with newer buildings uh, in the future. So you start off from the top, and then you enter into this courtyard. So the view is not repeated. The, how, the building is bo both uh, partially buried, tucked into the hill, not unlike the house I've shown before, but also leave protruding outwards. Geometrically, I think it's, it's quite straightforward. It's really a, a, a part of a sphere that, is, that, that, that constitutes the curvature. So on one hand, we wanted to, to see the building as a mass, but also as a building, as, as an arm that basically opens up. I think this whole idea of opening up and, and embracing is important. So on one hand, we created a building that's partially buried. On the other hand, it, we cladded it with this antiquated brick that the that the government wanted with these all the farm buildings that are around. And once you're in the courtyard, suddenly it's all cladded out of travertine with a, re a reflecting pool. 
and then also uh, an art gallery that's attached on the side. Uh, this is a, a project we finished about three years ago uh, in the town of Rosario in Argentina. It's on the edge of a, of a larger housing development. When we started the project, there was nothing around us, but we know that in the future, there will be three, uh, two of the four sides will have houses. So in the beginning, we have this panoramic view around this lot, but we know in the future there will be houses. So we're thinking of preemptively, think of how we can position the openings to, so that when new houses are built, you don't have the, they won't block the view of, the, of your house. The, the house itself is structured around a spiral circulation, and we, we position the windows at every turn of the spiral circulation. So every time you're at the landing, you see the view. So unlike uh, Philip Johnson's glass house where the view becomes a wallpaper, we wanted the view to be unfolded like striptease, you know, slowly and slowly until you get to the roof and then you have a panoramic view again. Um, uh, this is one of the first projects we started working abroad, and, and we know that we're far away. We don't have full control, so we, we try to think of ways to simplify uh, the geometry and the details. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very basic shape that is a, a, a marriage between an oval and a, a, a cube, and we decided to make four cuts in, in four corners, four alternating corners, because it would be a building sitting in a corner. So we really wanted it to be an object. So the four cuts are basically two straight cuts on curved surfaces, and then two curved surfaces, two curved cuts that are part of a sphere. And our logic is that if they uh, could build the form, form work for a sphere, they could easily build, build a fragment of a sphere. So at the end, the, the building becomes uh, very three-dimensional. And every time you see a facade, you almost want to turn right away to see another side. And this is an effect we try to create also in the interior of the house. So you see the volume, you see a deep aperture, and the aperture is always like adjacent to one of these cuts. And then you would spiral to the top of the roof, then you have this uh, um, panoramic view around the uh, Argentinian Pampas. We think a lot of how the mass relates to the horizon line. Um, when, when the project was finished, it was photographed and it was in some blog, and I, there was one, someone who commented that the building looks like a a marriage between a, a septic tank and a Mario Bota building, which we think it's a compliment for us. But I, I really like, a, like we seldom use like butt joint glass, but, but we, we use it here in, in, in counter to the heaviness of the volume. So it's almost the space becomes a soap bubble that are blown inside a heavy volume. And um, we diagrams that we use to show the unfolding of the path, how the, the windows and the apertures are always adjacent to one of these cuts. And then when you're in the interior space, you could see at different levels. On the second floor, the mezzanine, you can see the different framing of the, of the, of the surrounding views and always adjacent to one of these cuts. And we always bring natural light where the cuts occur. And then you end up in, in the stair that takes you up to the roof. Uh, I mean, we work a lot on single-family houses, but we try to think also of a, what are the larger implications of it. This is a, a developer's housing, and uh, the first house is a, basically a testing block. So if this is successful, they will buy more land. And we're trying to figure out with this strategy, if they buy like a few parcels, maybe they, they can think of a way to undo the typical rectangular volumes of the lot and actually fit more houses in the lot that even houses in between other houses could get a view. So this is a quick diagram for us to show that you know, in this way you can probably develop a block with more houses and they all have views in between other buildings. This is a house uh, that will start construction pretty soon in, um, in Oxnard. It's between Santa Barbara and Los Angeles and it's situated right in front of the beach. Um, it's, beautiful to be on the beach, but the problem with a lot of the houses on the beach is that everyone puts their living room and their master bedroom right in front, which are great for those two rooms, but then the rest of the house is terrible. It's dark. You always have to enter between houses to, to, to make a shop turn into the house. So the first thing we wanted to do is to bring a, a courtyard into the darkest space of the house and then bring the view as deep into the house as possible. So what we decided to do is to give every room in the house a shape, in this case a barrel vault that is directed towards the view, and then we pack all the barrel vaults into the buildable volume of the cube. 
So as a result, you have these rooms that are individualized, that defines the room, but then they're all directed towards the view. So uh, if you cut a series of transverse sections, you see all the, defi the different definitions of the room. Also, the house have to be raised because it's in the tsunami zone. So uh, the two-thirds of the house has to be raised in case the tsunami comes, it can go under the house. So we have a large room facing the beach, and then subsequently, the series of other rooms, the master bedroom behind the, the kitchen, the courtyard, all have fragments of the view. Here you see different uh, shots of the models of the rooms. And then when you're back in the beach, looking back into the house, you see this entire room that's ca almost carved out from a solid. And then you see a master bedroom tucked in and then a, a courtyard beyond. So you, you, you actually see the, see the house quite deeply. And uh, we use the same type of vaults to raise the house for the tsunami uh, code. Everything is constructed out of concrete on the first level. Everything above is constructed out of steel. So it's much more lightweight than other than uh, if, it, if it's constructed out of concrete. But steel also creates a lot of poche space. So we, we basically have a lot of cross bracing up here. We didn't have to spend money on uh, uh, moment connections. But then in the poche spaces, we could also hide a lot of the ventilation uh, HVAC ducts. Uh, we, we flipped the, the vault-shaped windows uh, upside down for the clear story windows on the side. So on, on one edge, it becomes very porous. Uh, and then on the other side, it's actually very dense. Uh, the street side is very dense. And a lot, there are a lot of Spanish colonial houses on that street. So on first glance, we want our house to also fit within this uh, Spanish colonial neighborhood. But I think in closer scrutiny, one would realize that there are no arches. They're all vaults. They're the different depths. And also the aggregation of the section begins to show by just the different heights of the apertures and the rooms. This is a house that we did earlier in, in Kauai, also the tsunami zone that we have to raise. Um, uh, I've basically shown you a series of houses like more like singular massive volumes, but we're also interested in the aggregation of volumes. Uh, whether we uh, uh, accentuate a skylight element as a volume of a house, as a series of galleries that we've done, or artist studios we've done, or adding on to a house by mo one of the early houses by Morphosis, when we took the volume and begin to turn it into a negative space, a courtyard, and a mass, um, or in uh, competition where we begin to uh, stack a series of trusses uh, for this Hong Kong Design Exhibition Center. So on one hand, all the smaller programs that are classrooms and, and offices are within the truss, and then all the spaces that need uh, columnless free space are in between. So in this way, we didn't have to put all the, the, the small rooms above the open spaces or vice versa. So, but now all the dance studios are always adjacent to the classrooms. But once we established this structural principle of stacking on top of one another, that you could have a lot more uh, variations to create intermediate responses, like having a plaza right across from the subway station. I think also it's a, for us it's a, a, a response to the, the, the verticality that's happening all around Southeast Asia in these satellite cities to create a horizontal response for a cultural institute. Um, we have also applied a similar logic to planning projects such as this one in Tianjin, uh, low-income housing. Um, the last few years, we have been um, invited to these projects that are, involve other architects. I think the first one is this quite crazy project in, in uh, Inner Mongolia, organized by Ai Weiwei and Herzog Damaron, where they invited 100 architects from around the world and each to design one villa. And, and right away, we, we know that the context for this project is not the Mongolian desert, but the uh, testosterone of 99 other architects around us that cannot wait to uh, be in this beauty contest. So we're thinking, like, what, what, how, what do you, how do you respond to this type of situation? You know, how do you, you know, when there's so much visual noise around you, can you be a little bit more quiet? You know, so, you know, we started looking at the work of uh, Ben and Hilla Besher or Dan Graham, looking at the very typical gable roof house. 
a lot of work has been done on this kind of primitive hut. So we thought, we were thinking, well, what is the next step? And, and maybe it's the double house. You know, we thought if the, the gable house, the monopoly house is the first one, the, the second house would be the double house. It would almost be the first step when a house wants to become a city. So we, begin, we, we started to be obsessed with this double house and begin to think of houses uh, inside this double house. And, and on one hand, we want to create a house that is very recognizable with the pitch roofs. On the other hand, a certain kind of defamiliarization. So it also has to do with how we position the house. So you, don't, you, you see the house, but you never really see it in a very frontal way. So it, it could look very heavy and massive, but then sometimes almost as thin as a sheet of paper. And, and that is also accentuated by, by pushing the windows to the edge of the volume and just leaving one course of break at the end. And we think a lot about apertures and openings, you know, how, how it could accentuate a mass and also how it could set in and create different uh, balconies. Sometimes it's very close to the edge, sometimes it's tucked in. Um, on the north side, a lot of wind coming in. We need to have much smaller windows. Our Swiss colleagues call this one the Playboy facade. We never really saw this bunny connection. Um, and also inside the house, you know, the, the theme of the double house of this Megaron gable roof shape is always present. Sometimes singularly in the master bedroom, or sometimes abstractly, like the, uh, the, the light the stairwell that connects all the floors together. It's also a, a vertical version of that. Um, before our first meeting, we didn't know how the house would work. You know, we, we, we superimposed this, this uh, profile onto this uh, Robert Venturi drawing of eclectic houses just to ease our, our shock when we, when we see the other work. So this was the first meeting when 100 architects got together and put their models onto the site. I guess historically it's not so um, uh, new to have this kind of international bau aus type of projects, but, uh, but never really in this scale, like almost a, a big architectural zoo. Um, and I think one of the things with uh, those who are familiar with Ai Weiwei's work who brought like uh, he, there's a social political project that he's always involved with. I think he's much more interested in that than, than really building 100 houses. I think it's really putting 100 architects in a hotel in the desert for three days and see what will happen. And, and, and really, uh, being there in Mongolia, we, we met a lot of colleagues whose work we are familiar with in, in print but never met in person and actually developed some uh, friendship and future collaborations. And this is one of the collaborations. This is a project in, in Chile around the city of Concepcion where uh, the government uh, uh, funded the project, invited 10 uh, international uh, architects to each design a com small community center around the areas that were devastated by the earthquake. Uh, programmatically, it's very open. They wanted each particular community to either use the space for a meeting hall or a temporary classroom. I think the bigger goal is to inspire new construction around the devastated area. So our site is, is uh, situated on a bluff, uh, surrounded by oak trees and, and with a view of the, the ocean. Um, so for us, I think it's in a way to also commemorate the earthquake, uh, uh, create a, a place of peace and contemplation. How does, does one uh, create a space that frame a view that is already quite beautiful? So we decided to use two rooms. One room is open to the sky, which is a courtyard. So you walk through this uh, 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 pine tree forest into a room. And then you walk into exactly the same shape room, but it's basically directed through to the ocean. So you walk through a space that purges you, and then you walk to a room that is purely about the view. These are some study models, and we ended up with uh, this volume. So one courtyard that opens up to the sky and the other to the view. And then we, we put all the uh, bathrooms and the offices in the poche space. So we, and we also left the earth the way it is. So you walk through the pine forest. You see this corner, which is in access to the opening of the, the second room. And you walk into a space that basically is just the wall and the trees above you. And then you enter into a room. This is a diagram looking back from the outside. But the curved wall, we, we put this uh, high polished chrome around it. So it reflects the view also, but in a blurry way. So we're thinking of ways of bringing the view in, into the room itself and stretch the horizon line. 
So just in a model, you see the view, but then the horizon line is, is brought in. Just apologies for the blurry slide. Um, this is another project that came from the Autos project. This is a, a, a nine architects um, in um, Lake Geneva in Switzerland uh, with a, a lot facing the, the lake. It's, it's a sloping lot. And uh, uh, Kristen Gantenbein from Basel did the master plan. And then this is our building. This is Kristen Gantenbein's building. This is uh, Alejandro Aravena from Chile. Um, uh, Erich Mateus from Portugal. Sergis and Bates from London, Tatiana Bilbao from Mexico City, uh, Gears and Van Severin from Belgium, uh, Atelier Bauau, Tokyo, um, Lacaton Vassal from France. Uh, Gunther Vogt, uh, the landscape architect, is responsible for designing the entire landscape. And Gunther Vogt decided to put the parking, all the vehicular traffic, underground. So the entire landscape will be planted by trees and pedestrianized. So our lot is pretty much in the center of the entire, entire site, and we decided to have a series of courtyards so that our neighbors that are above us could walk through our building, through our building this way and this way, and walk down to the lake. So we have a series of spaces that are hinged and excavated from this volume. We decided to push the, the building to the maximum buildable volume. So on one hand, you have this very open view from the outside, and then have a much more enclosed and almost urban, a monastic type of, of courtyard, but still with minimum openings that are directed towards the view. So in a way, it's like an inside outhouse. I, we think it's more urban inside in the courtyards and more open in the periphery. So much larger openings with trees around. And then when you're in the courtyard where People will walk through as well as one could enter from the parking below. You always walk up to one of these courtyards before you enter into your, into your building. Uh, we, we like the idea of courtyards that are very contained, but also in, you always have a glimpse of the next courtyard from these uh, hinges. Uh, um, I mean, I think Jeffrey talked about this, having different architects in one space. And I, more, like, more lately, we've been... Uh, invited to these projects that it's kind of like a curatorial urbanism. Other architects are involved and I think a lot of these architects that are in these groups we share a similar sensibility but very different approaches. Uh, this is the last project I'm going to show is uh, a, a project in the town of Grotta Frata, uh, south of Rome, about 20 kilometers south of Rome, a suburb of Rome. It's known for a famous uh, monastery uh, that is uh, famous for uh, its, its paper restoration techniques. They restored the Da Vinci Codex there. This is the site. It's an old uh, hotel that's been abandoned for more than 25 years, uh, right next to the, the main street of the town, uh, Corso de Popolo. The, uh, the client uh, wanted to build an art complex there with a private art museum, with a uh, uh, artist in residency program, mixed together with creative offices and uh, condominiums, as well as uh, a small hotel. So they decided to give the park back to the, to the city and in return, build more uh, buildings in the, in the back area. There are a lot of uh, ruins in the building that we have to take away, and at the end, there are only four buildings that we have to preserve. One is a 19th century villa. The other is a 19th century uh, carriage house that has been evolved over time. And there's a 1950s housing, and then there's a 1960s hotel. So these are four buildings that we have to uh, rehabilitate. We did a lot of uh, uh, case studies to explain to the city what does it mean to have a, an idea of an art complex as well as a dispersed museum. So we had to gather a lot of examples like pavilions in the park or we call this art urbanism projects where a museum is not just one building but scattered throughout the city like Marfa, Texas or uh, Renzo Piano in, in Houston for the Dominion where there's a big mothership but then also smaller pavilions that are integrated within a residential neighborhood. Um, we also you know, use uh, examples like uh, Bernard Chumi's Park La Villette, which is really a grid, versus someone like John Hayduck, who designed all the buildings as if they're actors. We want to find something in between that, something that's systematic, like Bernard Chumi, but also be able to adapt to its particular situation. So we, we start off with an alphabet, you know, with this basic volume, three basic volumes of gallery spaces. They could stand alone like an island. They could be agglomerated together like an archipelago. 
So these are just different ways they could hinge, they could stack as a conceptual idea. And then the plan is basically we would have two or three pavilions in the park that would serve as a restaurant, serve as a sculpture pavilion, serve as an entry pavilion. And then uh, we would uh, agglomerate nine of these pavilions together to form the creative office building. We would hinge six of them together to form the museum. And then we'll put 21 together to form the housing. So on, on one hand, they're, they're, they're recognizable that are part of this new development. On the other hand, they all morph to the existing, respond to the existing context. In this case, the museum is attached to the 19th century carriage house. Throwing it in context, or in this case, the creative office building really responds to these villas that are sitting around open spaces. And then the, the housing project is um, we, we wanted the occupants to enter from the top because you, not only do you have a better view, but when you enter from the top and you have a roof garden and you, you descend down into your living room and then having the bedroom below, we basically could give the land that is us usually uh, sectioned off for the garden back into the entire development. So the, the ground floor became more public by placing the entry garden on the rooftop. This is an exhibition that we did with the artist Bali Beshti. Um, well, because I ended with, uh, because I started with artwork, I'm going to end with three pieces uh, of uh, work by uh, John Baldassari, uh, a friend and an artist we really admire. This is a, this is a piece uh, done in the 70s. The title of this piece is uh, "Using Your Finger to Achieve a Straight Line." And uh, uh, the story for us for this piece is that there's always an ideal, in this case, the straight line, and, and then you use what you have in your disposal to achieve that. But rather than lamenting that the ideal could never be achieved, I think you s utilize the discrepancy of what you can do and what your ideal is as the content of the work. Uh, the second piece is uh, titled uh, uh, Throwing Three Balls into the Air to Achieve an Equilateral Triangle. Uh, the best of 36 tries. Uh, and and, and uh, similar to the first piece about chance and ideal, I think also like thinking about the, the process and, and use the process as part of the work, as part of the content of the work. Um, the last piece is titled uh, Using uh, Cigar Smoke to Match Different Clouds. Uh, and, uh, it's entirely absurd, but I think it's, it's a really good uh, reflector uh, of, of what an architect does. I think sometimes the, the tasks that are given to us are very straightforward, like you know, match the clouds, and sometimes the tools that are given to us are very straightforward, like a match and a cigar. Um, uh, as an architect, I sometimes find myself go about ways uh, that are not very natural, like uh, the analogy would be use the match to dissect the cigar and, and organize the tobacco leaves that will still simulate a, a cloud and, and then congratulate myself afterwards for all the hard work that's done. I think this, this piece uh, helped remind me uh, not to forget the most natural way of, of proceeding, uh, uh, which is to light the cigar. And that way, I think you can taste the tobacco and enjoy it and um, create some smoke. And, and once in a while, if you're lucky, you get to make some clouds too. So that's the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And if I could invite you, Mark, to take a seat, Jeffrey, to take a seat. And I'll just use this opportunity to thank uh, Jess Wyszynski, um, who has been amazing the whole series and put under some stress there with the technical problems. But once again, is able to solve them. So um, this, we're moving into a sort of hybrid conversation slash uh, taking questions from the floor. But I, might, I thought I might start with uh, you, Mark, as uh, a recent <coughs> arrival in Australia, just to ask about your pr practice. Um, you, you showed a, an amazing array of work, um, some of it done in Los Angeles, some of it done uh, across the country and also the international work you're doing. I was just wondering how big is the practice and uh, um, how many people are in the office and, and how do you organise uh, mm -hmm. the office to, to work at, uh, both locally and uh, mm -hmm. globally so successfully? I mean, uh, we have a small office. We, we have between 10 and 15 people the last five years, I would say. 
And uh, the first few years, like many Los Angeles architects, we basically work on single-family houses. And, uh, but we, we started working with the art community very quickly, uh, from art collectors or mm-hmm. collaborators and renovations. And, and what took us abroad were actually from the art community. Mm. You know, so there were uh, international art collectors that we met, you know, that were collecting American art. We started doing one project in Italy, and one thing led to another. And uh, the decision to work internationally was not uh, was an innocent one. You know, I think it started two, three years ago. There was an opportunity, and we we thought things were going bad. We didn't expect it to be as bad as in ni- 2008. Mm. And uh, also, these projects were all in the private sector. So, uh, uh, so we started, you know, taking the chance to go abroad. Certainly, it's very hard to to. Uh, coordinate, you know, we always have to find local partners that are mm-hmm. familiar with the code and familiar with mm-hmm. the politics, you know, yes. especially in Italy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it must be interesting to see uh, Jeffrey's presentation and for the first time get a sense of uh, practice in Australia. I guess maybe are there any um, remarks you'd like to make comparing your experience in Los Angeles with the kind of uh, situations that Jeffrey was talking about mm-hmm. in Perth and uh, in Melbourne? I mean, I find that very uh, inspiring because uh, in the U.S., uh, there are a lot of you know, the, we never really had a Baumeister, you know. I, mean, I think about like even Stimmann or, or, or in Europe, uh, because I taught in Europe for a few years, so I had the exposure of how young architects could start with competitions or competitions that are real, that are funded, that they're a governing body to oversee. That they, you know, as opposed to American competitions, oftentimes. They don't have the money to build. They don't have the site. They use the PR money to uh, to to start a competition, and then you spend all this time on. You might win, and you don't get to build it. And basically, you become part of a pond to help raise money, which is fine. You know? mm-hmm. But I I, I I seldom participate in competitions in uh, in, in the U.S. But but uh, I, I think we're always jealous or, or envious of having. Uh, um, uh, a Baumeister role, you know, a, a, a chief architect, government architect. They're very supportive. You know, we talked about uh, teaming young architects to with uh, more seasoned practices. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we we took these projects abroad, at with a lot of risk too, because we know that if we stay in the states and only in the states, there are certain building types we'll never get to build because. They would say, well, you've never built a library. There's no chance you ever build a library. They basically count the amount of points that you've done. Mm-hmm. So uh, with these opportunities abroad, we know that we can do some of these projects. Then it will be easier for us to come back. Yep. You know? So I'd like to invite some questions from mm-hmm. the, the audience. Question over here. This is a question for Mark. I was just wondering if um, you've ever revisited any of your projects and um, been surprised by uh, the client's adaptation of the spaces, or it kind of comes out of when you were talking about um, mm-hmm. the representation of your work and mm-hmm. the uh, Julius bringing in his mm-hmm. own furniture, and if you've ever gone back and been like, oh, mm-hmm. I didn't expect it to kind of mm-hmm. be used like this. <laughs> mm-hmm. That uh, I think I've revisited all of them, um, and there are a lot of surprises. Uh, I I didn't mention also a couple of the houses. I, I also was involved in developing them. Um, I, I don't know if it's a Los Angeles thing. You know, maybe the film industry is there. You know, when when someone say they're they're a filmmaker, they're not necessarily just a, a director. Sometimes they uh, produce, they're involved with the production. Sometimes they write. Sometimes I think that should be in the architecture world too. You know, so I mean, for a single house, uh, it's much easier to be part of a developer. So for the Hill House as well as the house in Argentina, we also uh, uh, together with the team developed the house. So we didn't design it for a particular client. So it was a, they're both spec houses. Um, and uh, the person who inhabited the Hill House is a jewelry and fashion designer, collected a lot of East Indian artifacts. So the house is not very, doesn't seem very minimal when you go in. It's actually quite warm. But, but I think your question also points to, you know, I, you know, there are different types of modernist or minimalist spaces. 
And I always love the spaces that can accommodate like Victorian furniture. You know, I hate minimal spaces that you can only use Barcelona chairs. Everything has to be in place. You know, I think if you look at an、uh, architect like Alvaro Siza, you know, very simple, very humble furniture. The space is still strong, and you know that's a good space. And I think this is something we aspire to also. Thank you. Any other questions? This gentleman. Ah,、oh, one、yeah. here. Uh, hello.、Um, being someone who worked in the Queensland State Government for around 20 years,、um, I'd just like to commend Victoria for the quality of architecture that's coming out in their schools and their, their approach down there.、Uh, we were stuck with standard schools up here for many years.、Um, the school that was、uh, built under the education program、um, was the government involved in the process of the concept of that school. And are you aware of what the concept was?、Uh, it seemed to be based on a series of hand-like shapes, and it creates an internal space that's quite attractive because you don't have square corners and、um, certain efficiencies of space、um, out of that non-rectangular shape.、Uh, do you want to comment on that?、Uh, like the rest of Australia during the education revolution,、uh, Victoria was required to use templates to speed. Delivery, but fortunately,、uh, the education department commissioned two very good firms with deep experience in school design to work closely together to come up with some extremely flexible templates.、Uh, there were the usual problems of siting, usual problems of uh, sustainability um, emerging through the process, and the school that wanted the science block getting the library. But、uh, in the main, I'd have to say that the outcome in Victoria、um, was stronger than most places in Australia.、Uh, the process that emerged、uh, from that Fitzroy School by McBride Charles Ryan,、um, I, don't, I don't know a great deal about it. it. I know that it emerged as a result of McBride Charles Ryan working very closely with the school community, with the teachers and the students, to develop. An alternative approach. It's a it's a kind of blob form that's grafted onto an existing late fifties, early sixties edition to the Fitzroy School. So it's a very stark、uh, limpet on this old building. But from what I understand,、uh, it's been extraordinarily well received by the school community. Very flexible in use. There's another question over here. Peter Skinner. Yeah, a question, Jeffrey. You said that Victoria, each of the departments, do their own procurement to some extent,、um, and, and I, I, I guess in Queensland, one of, one of the issues is really not the buildings, the public works that the government architect works on. It's, it's the infrastructure, it's the rail, it's the roads, it's the, it's the train stations. What, what scope is there for the government architect in Victoria to have input into those various departments that are doing the really big moves in the city? Um, I have to say that by the time I arrived there, the battle had been largely won.、Um, Vic, Vic Roads invite our involvement in projects,、um, and the Department of Trans- with the Department of Transport, we have a very good, close working relationship. The, the difficulty that emerges again is the way projects are procured, where architects are often minor parts of big teams, and then you have to work very hard from the outset to ensure that quality of design again. Is a key factor in the way the project selection、uh, moves down the track,、um, but they're all very receptive.、Uh, they've got good people at the top, as I say. That's that can be a fugitive thing.、Um, these are people who are, are receptive to the ideas now. Who's to say that the next people in will be? But、uh, I, I found it a very positive experience working with those big infrastructure agencies. Now, there's a question off the back. Hi, I just had a question for Mark.、Um, I was hoping to know,、um, with the advancement that we see in technology and the use of it in architecture,、um, in terms of your practice, to what extent do you leave technology alone、um, in the in the creative process,、um, and at what point do you feel it's useful? Because I've noticed、um, there are people that 
whether it's parametric modeling or all these other things that are being encouraged, um, they heavily rely on sort of random algorithms or whatever to produce something that appears creative. But um, what's your opinion on that? I'd like to know. Well, um, having been involved in a school like UCLA, who, you know, were one of the first schools that utilized CNC milling, CAD CAM design, uh, maybe 12, 13 years ago. Uh, at that time, there's a certain optimism about it, you know, that can change the world. Everyone was using parametric surfaces. Everyone was designing with Maya. But uh, pretty soon, I think in four or five years, everyone else has the machine. You know, like, oh, you, it's almost like software. Bruce Mao said you can't really rely on software because otherwise everyone will have it. Uh, pretty soon everyone will have a copy of that software. So I think right now it's a very interesting moment because I don't think it's new anymore. So uh, people don't have to do it if they don't need to. I mean, also now we can see that uh, there are certain scales that CNC and, and CAD CAM design work better in, such as industrial design, you know, than, than in larger scale projects. You know, I think in our scale of practice, probably it's used like in, in cabinet, cabinetry work. Uh, there was one project we didn't show was a, a gas station for BP um, that we did with a team of architects. And, and that we use a lot of uh, CAD CAM because they want to finish design and finishing permit everything constructed in, in eight months. Uh, they want to open the time when they had the Academy Awards. Ask me why, I have no idea. But it was a big engine. This is part of the PR money. So this is, we want to build this eight months. You know? And that helped us a lot. That helped us a lot in terms of you know, BIM. We get all the people together. We, we, we have pieces of being prefabricated off of the site, and it reflected in the shape of the building. But I don't find this as something that is uh, 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 that one is imperative to use anymore. I think it's almost like invisible technology. Uh, final question. Uh, it's, it seems the world's going green for some reason or another, and I'd like to ask both of you the same question. Um, could you uh, explain in the way that you do architecture how you see sustainability in two areas? One is in the design process of what architecture is all about and secondly, what happens to the, what the influence of that's going to be on the people who actually are going to be living or working in that building over the period of time afterwards? <laughs> I, I could reflect on the experience of the Council House 2 building in Melbourne where um, it became a mission of the whole city, the whole, the whole group of employees within the city of Melbourne mm -hmm. to realise for themselves a building that was going to give them a much better work environment. Um, and I, I don't know whether you've ever seen that building, but it is essentially structured from all of the various elements that contribute to its sustainability performance, which is high. Um, all reports suggest that internally... Um, it's a far healthier environment. Um, days taken off work are reduced. Um, certainly I'm aware when I enter that building that you do get a sense of fresher air uh, being circulated through the building. They purge it each night. Um, the, the people who actually use the building have become great fans of it. The one downside of it that I'm aware of is that the level of lighting internally is lower than you might like it to be mm -hmm. for certain tasks. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a case study for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, think, uh, um, I think for us, sustainability is also something that's always present. It's, it's a lot co is common sense, a lot is design intelligence. I, I think the last few years with LEED, you know, also more uh, a higher degree of consciousness among users. I think uh, people ask us to do things that are you wear sustainability more on your sleeve than before, and so I, I think it's a phase. I don't. I think you know. I think public awareness is important. It's always should be there, but I, I don't think you people always need to be. Uh, 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 buildings need to be uh, self-conscious. Are always putting photovoltaic panels on the roof. Uh, sorry, can you mention the ratio again? 
the two ratios? The, the One between the most people see sustainability as, as legal, let's use sanitation, people, or whatever. Yeah. But look at sustainability of the people within, inside those buildings. Is there a ratio that we're spending too much time on the, the lighting and everything else and we're forgetting about the people? Is there a percentage mm -hmm. ratio between the two? Mm -hmm. Or have you made that discovery? I was sitting in uh, mm -hmm. the art centre in LA and the guy said that we've now discovered that the environment Okay, well on that note, could you please join with me in thanking Jeffrey London and Mark Lee.